Uh, a lot more people um, than what would be allowed for five minutes of testimony per person. We're going to put it down to three. Just what happens is I'm going to set a little timer, and you'll hear a very gentle reminder that three minutes are up. Finish up your thought, and then we'll move on to the next person. Um, the reason we're doing that is just so that everybody who wants to s provide testimony has the opportunity to do so. And then if we get to the end and there is time left, we can come back around and and have additional thoughts or anybody who did not sign in to speak. So I should have introduced myself first. I'm sorry, Katie Pring, I work for How uh, Senator Howard Markline. Um, I'm just here to provide support today and keep everything moving on, tr on track. If you have something you don't want to talk about or you have a handout or something you want to talk about privately, I'll be over at the table and we can um, contact, you know, be in contact there as well. So. The, the rules today are pretty simple. This is a listening session. The legislators are here to listen to your concerns, uh, primarily about the budget, but if it's something else, feel free to, to say what you, what, you're, what you came here to say. Uh, they will not be doing Q&A or debate. This is really just so that they hear your input. We also ask that you treat each other with respect too, so everybody's ideas and input is treated fairly and evenly. Um, so that everyone feels comfortable to say what they want to say to the legislators today. So with that, I'll, I'll give them a chance to say hello, and then we'll get started. Good morning. I'm Senator Howard Markline. I represent all of Richland County and areas to the east and south and, and north. So anyway, thanks, everybody, for uh, for uh, showing up today and for sharing your, your feedback. Uh, this is the seventh, I think, seventh uh, listening session that uh, that I've done. Uh, throughout my district. We're trying to get to kind of every corner of the district and provide opportunity. So uh, anyway, um, I won't uh, take up any more time, but uh, thanks again for all of you to be here. Uh, thank you. I'm Representative Travis Trannell. I represent all of Grant County, uh, portions of Iowa and Lafayette County, and about a third of the western part of Richland County. Uh, great to see so many people show up today. Really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And would also like to uh, thank Katie uh, for the fine work that she did because since Howard uses his staff to do this, then our staff doesn't have to. So we appreciate that. I'm State Representative Tony Kurtz. I represent all of Juneau County and what I always say, the best part of Richland County, uh, Monroe County, Vernon County, and uh, Sauk County. And I'm uh, Happy to be here. I'm glad to see so many people here. And then our previous state representative just snuck in, Representative Ed Brooks. I think he's giving me a job interview, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Evaluation. <laughs> Evaluation, that's right. But anyway, thanks for coming. I appreciate that. So. All right, so we'll jump right into the first person is Connie Champnoise. Yes. yes. Got it. Hi. Uh, thank you all for coming and for having these listening sessions. They're very important to us in the community. Um, I'm really concerned about groundwater and the groodwater contamination, and specifically karst geology. And I was hoping that you would fund uh, a karst study of all of the karst geology of Wisconsin, that whole U-shaped part, a lot of Richmond centers in karst geology. And we really believe that that geology drives how um, water use should be um, decided. It's very specific to the geology of the area. So Richland County is going to be a little different than Grant than Cal. And we really need help in studying it. And we don't have the money in Richland County. We're a very poor county. So we need you to fund um, studies that look at the karst geology and water uh, susceptibility to contamination. Also, uh, this is just a quote, and I and I know that you're not doing a Q&A, but um, 
Representative Trammell, you said as long as government keeps subsidizing farmers to keep them in business, our job of protecting water quality is going to be a lot harder. I don't understand that quote. I, I don't know what that means, what the subsidies are that make it hard to um, uh, protect our water. And this was in Southwest News in January. So thank you again for your time. Okay, great. Um, next is Melissa Luck. Hi. I'm Melissa Luck. I'm a Richland County Board Supervisor. And um, I just really want to make sure as you move through the budget process that you do keep in mind that the water has been an issue that's in the headlines. It's Everyone's concerned about it, and they're looking to their counties to do something about it. And so we are going to really need your support as you move through the budget process. Um, I know it's in the governor's budget, um, but I, my understanding is you're writing a different budget. So if you could please um, designate some monies to help us do studies and also to help our citizens as we deal with what we may find as we go through the process. So thank you. Great. Um, next up is Duke Welter. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for having this session, as, I, as it's been already said. Uh, this is a real nice opportunity for citizens to have a chance to share their concerns with you. Uh, my name is Duke Welter. I work with the Driftless Area Restoration Effort uh, for Trout Unlimited. We work with a lot of uh, agencies and communities and conservation clubs across the entire Driftless Area, 24,000 square miles, to put together watershed restoration projects. And they have, they have impacts on phosphorus and nitrates, sedimentation, and uh, and they buffer streams uh, and they bring things back to, to better health. Uh, we've got a lot of recovery to do after uh, 100 years of hard land use across the region and, and uh, we're working hard on trying to do that and, and uh, buffer these streams also against the kind of flooding that we've been, that we've been experiencing. Uh, if we can work up in the tributaries successfully, we can have an impact across watersheds. Um, one of the uh, one of the things that we've done a couple of times is we've looked at the economic impact of recreational angling in the Driftless area, and uh, our economic consultants in both cases concluded that outside anglers are bringing in over a billion dollars a year into the region, and that has an impact on communities that understand what, uh, what it might help to do to diversify their economies. Uh, and they, uh, there, are, there are communities that are taking note of that. We're also working our, our local groups, uh, such as the Harry and Laura Nor chapter, which is based out of Dodgeville and Fenimore, has worked, worked up hard on some really notable projects, and they've, and they've exemplified what we try to do across the region. They brought in money from NRCS and trout stamp money and money from private sources, and, and we really like it when groups from Chicago and Milwaukee and Madison show up and bring a fair amount of money and a lot of volunteers to work on projects. Over in the Blue River, if you're familiar with that, um, there's been about 18 miles of restoration that's gone on since 2003. That's been a tremendous impact on that watershed. And it continues to allow us to do more work. When you work on the tributaries and work downstream, it allows you to do more work and have an impact farther downstream. One of the, one of the key parts of this is that we've said all along that we won't work on a stream and won't put trout unlimited money into a stream that we can only see from a bridge. And the, one of the requirements has been that if we do a project, we're going to we're going to work to find all the money from sources other than a landowner. And what we ask of the landowner is a legal public fishing easement permit. And we've added across the region since we started this program about 500 miles of public access. So there are going on 1,300 miles of public access that's uh, held across the region by by the states, by counties, including Rich Richland County, uh, and by uh, private nonprofits. Uh, so one of the keys to that has been the stream bank easement program of the DNR that's funded with stewardship money. Now, there isn't a stewardship um, uh, reauthorization per se in the, in the budget, but uh, we believe that as we're starting to talk about what to do with the stewardship program, which is expiring in 2020, uh, it's really important for our region to uh, continue to support stream bank easement purchases by the DNR. The, the legislature has set aside about $3 million a year to do that across the state. 
and we've added many, many easements on which we can then do projects. So we'll do about $8 million worth of uh, projects across the region, Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin this year, but they're all predicated on the idea that you're going to have an easement. So that stream bank easement program is important for projects and access and economic impact, and we urge you to continue to support that. It's very important. I spent seven years on the Natural Resources Board. It was before you, you all uh, began your service in the, in the legislature. And we, um, oh, you, you got Your the, time's up. Was that the green light or the red light? No, uh, just and, finish up your thought. Okay, and I was, I was, I chaired the, the board's stewardship committee at that time. And, uh, and saw the opportunity that we had to buy these easements and to buy key parcels of land through the, for the state through the DNR. That is something that's really important to our region. It's had a huge benefit on, on uh, public land access and, and acquisition of crucial places. So I urge when you get into the reauthorization discussion that you'll support those. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Barb Boyce. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about the upcoming budget. As one of your constituents, I hope you make this next budget for the people and not for big business and lobbyists. Right. Uh, Republicans have had control for many years now, but the surplus you say we have, using the general accepted accounting principles uh, recommended by the SEC, we really have a deficit. Our deficit is $1.25 billion. Now, yes, this is less than it has been in previous years, but the general economic conditions across the country show us that we are in 11th place. And, I, and, I, and I'm sorry, I can't say that for sure, but we are not up there for decreasing our, our deficit like other, other states have. They have. Other states have no deficit now because of the economic boom. So I hope that this budget will address that. <clears throat> that being said, one of the main problems in Southwest Wisconsin today is, as we know, everybody say, is water quality. After findings were aired about the um, water problems in some of the counties that we represent, uh, Boss started a water quality task force, which I believe set up in the run. Kind of ironic, since we've had this problem for years and years, and now that it's finally aired, we have a committee. So I hope this isn't committee to death when nothing is done. Um, personally, my feeling in our area is that castles are a huge problem. <coughs> this isn't going against farmers, they don't get upset. I think small farmers have definitely shown a respect and a love for the environment. The capitals I have not seen do that. They have rules and regulations, they're not always followed, and there's very little follow-up on when they do, when they are found to be um, not going according to the rules and laws. Um, funding the DNR better might help. They need more people to go around these capitals. Apparently 14 capitals to one DNR person is recommended, and right now our DNR people have more than 20. So maybe that would be an answer. I know that you want your children and grandchildren to have clean air and clean water. We've got to start doing something now. We can't just keep saying, well, okay, they contribute to my campaign. I'm not going to fight them. We've got to. This is time for us to do something about our water. However, uh, Senator, you're also on the um, JFC, and you objected to implement a health services initiative uh, for regarding lead in water, which is affecting children. Um, I cannot understand why you wouldn't want to solve this problem since lead in water causes neurological and brain damage and it's not reversible. Fixing the problem before it gets started will prevent many millions of dollars of, of health care costs. Um, and the biggest boondoggle in our state's history and for our budget, of course, is Foxconn. Um, it hasn't turned into the billions that have been promised yet. But just the amount of money that has been spent in Southwest Wisconsin regarding the infrastructure there to build this plant, the roads, buying the land, paying Mount Pleasant because they couldn't afford to pay for all this themselves. The infrastructure costs have been horrendous and millions of dollars that we didn't need to spend on that big boondoggle. None of this has helped us. I don't see any, I haven't heard of one reason why this has helped Southwest Wisconsin and that's what we're supposed to be representing. 
remember, please, in your budget, think about us, the people, and think wisely and vote for the people, not what your party tells you, not what the lobbyists want, but what is good for the people. Thank you. Next up is Pat O'Boyle. And sorry, I'm going to take this table out, so I'm sorry to cause a ruckus. <laughs> sure. Okay. Yes, I'm going to have this opportunity to express my profound disappointment uh, in your having held this lame duck session. As a voter, I felt <coughs> disrespected and saw that saw that my intention to put Tony Evers in and his policies was virtually ignored. In this lame duck session, you cut out his legs, you took the power, many of his gubernatorial powers away, you took out the powers, you removed some of the powers from his attorney general. We're spending money now litigating cases that Republicans don't, um, uh, that the Republicans are not on board with um, it, when they're not compatible with the Attorney General's um, uh, caseload. So anyway, I just, I just think it set a really bad tone. You know, we're, we're in a hyper-polarized political situation, and right out the gate, first thing you did after the election was remove the powers in the, in the statewide uh, offices. We, the people of Wisconsin, the majority of us that were not impacted by gerrymandering, by the way, um, voted for a new policy agenda. Please respect the will of the people moving forward. That's basically it. Thank you. Next up is Noah Rothering. Rothering? I'll skip? Okay. Um, next then would be Don Brander. First, uh, for Howard, uh, why doesn't the state use capital power accounting? And I keep hearing the toll roads kicked around, but I, somebody has to explain to me how it would take millions to conform the roads to a toll road. Did it take millions to man it 24-7? It would take millions to do the accounting on it separate. If you just draw a line through the present state gasoline tax and change the figure, you have income coming in tomorrow where if you do a tool road, it will take at least a couple of years before any uh, income comes in that the expenditures will start immediately. Set. Right. Next up is um, Mary Rondu. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yep, yeah, Rondu. Okay. Um, first, the year of clean water. I guess that's what Governor Evers has declared, which is exciting. It's something we can all get behind, obviously. Uh, city me everybody um, and, I, and I've heard that there's a, a budget um, in the budget there's a 25% uh, in the transportation budget there's a 25% charge for debt reduction which I've seen of course if we've got this giant um, surplus you think we pay for some of that um, pay off some of that debt also I'm uh, kind of opposed to a Bob's um, those that's a, like a, a big chunk of money um, I was at the state fair a few years ago, and the woman from the transportation department that had a booth there said she couldn't help me with anything because she only dealt with $500 million projects. Um, I wish I had $500 million. I wish I had 10 cents, actually. And I, and I challenge all of you to drive on Highway 171 from uh, 14 to the Crawford County line. That road is almost uh, dust. It's horrible. And I, I live on what was a gravel road, but now is dirt because um, there's just, there's no money for, we can't have everything. We either have, we either have gravel, we have a truck, we have an employee, it doesn't, it doesn't match. So we, obviously we need more money. And um, I'm all for phys, phys, uh, fiscal conservatism, but I, but I much prefer responsibility, fiscal responsibility. Um, the smoke and mirrors, and Mr. Markley, you, you're a CPA, 
and I, I agree with the woman behind me that budgeting is a smoke and mirror kind of thing and it's all whatever. I, I don't know. I don't understand it. Not even close. But um, so thanks for having this. And, and sometimes I wish we could have a little back and forth. Never been to one of those. And I just have to say I, I, I'm sorry you responded to the, the vulgarity and the threats that you got, Mr. Markline. I, it, to me, it's like small children. Now I know what will get your attention. I haven't been able to get your attention with anything I've, I've ever, I write a lot. I've never gotten an email back with, for anything. So, um, I mean, I'm not going to, I don't espouse vulgarity and threats, but uh, it did get, get, got your attention and you responded to that. So, thank you. Next up is Beverly Pesco. Uh, Senator Markline, you have presented yourself, especially during the campaign, as an independent thinker and making independent decisions. However, we have your voting record. And we know that you have voted virtually 100% of the time down straight party lines. And many of those votes have not been to the benefit of the 17th State Senate District. And what I'm asking for you today is that in the future, maybe, we can see you as you go through all these multiple issues in the budget that affect the 17th that you will consider the needs and the interests of the 17th State Senate District above the demands of the party bosses and your corporate donors. Yeah. Next up is Aaron Palmer. <clears throat> I'm going to stay seated while I talk. Um, I didn't have prepared notes or anything for today. I've just been scribbling down a few things as we were talking. And I guess first and foremost, I'd like to thank Senator Markheim for his proactive approach on water quality issues. I know you've been leading from the out front on this for the last couple of years, well before it uh, hit the headlines here in the last six months to, uh, or so. Um, so thank you very much. And along that same line, I <clears throat> understand Trav, uh, Representative Trannel and Representative uh, Kurtz here are pointed to a water quality task force. So I, I know that you guys will do well for the southwest region here of Wisconsin. <coughs> thank you very much for your leadership on that task force. Um, we're talking budget, we're talking, um, I guess, spending money. Um, if you're here today to, to take in feedback about the budget and what we all think about it, frankly, I think increasing spending by $7 billion is wrong. We should not be increasing spending. Do we have a, do we have a surplus from the last eight years? Well, I know we saved money in the last eight years, but we still have a deficit because what, what, was, what was there to start with in 2010? Um, <coughs> So, don't increase spending. That, that, that's just, we don't have the money to spend. And then that increases taxes by some $700 million, not to mention the property tax increase that um, is being proposed. So, and then another thing, I know in the last fall we heard a lot about Foxconn, and, and that doesn't help all of us out here in the, in the 17th Senate District or Southwest Wisconsin. In all, in all honesty, Never even thought about it before until I just heard a comment a little bit ago about it. Um, but it does help us out. In fact, I, I'm heading down to Kenosha County next week because I got hired by Kenosha County to do something that is a direct domino result because of Foxconn. So it does help us because I do live out here. Um, and, and, and same thing like with the way other money is spent in uh, transportation. <coughs> I, you got to move goods, you got to move people throughout the state. And I understand the money's going to be spent on the roads that have the highest density uh, volume of traffic. And I understand that. And again, as a company that works in transportation, it helps us. You know, I have over half a dozen uh, employees of the company I work for live right here in Merchant County. And we, we, we did a lot of design work on the I-39 expansion project. So it, it, I know not everybody sees that, but it does help. So you know, that's helping to pay taxes here in Richland County because we're providing jobs that are being funded from uh, design work on I-39. So I guess that's all I have. Again, I just wanted to thank, you know, wrap it up, is I, I know water quality, you know, everybody wants to beat that drum. It's important to everybody, and it should be. But, you know, it's, it, we didn't just open that book today. It was opened quite a few years ago, and, and thank you, Howard Mark Glenn, for uh, taking leadership and being proactive on that. That's all I have. Next up is, sorry, Lee Van, Van Landite. Very good. Thank you. It took me years to learn. <laughs> uh, I got my notes. 
from people speaking here already. Uh, groundwater is a big issue. How many people would like to see groundwater being one of the top issues for this portion of the state? Please raise your hands. Because what we're doing is, is we're dealing with individuals who have indicated things, but you need to see that I think the bulk of the people are behind this. This is not an individual issue. It's something all of us face. We had a program on Saturday that dealt with that. And of the 70, or how many, how many wells were there, 94,000? 3,000 of those are in this county. And most of us rely on that, and it's, it's extremely important. I rely on it. And you know, my neighbor can pollute, and I'm gonna get it. And this can be from miles away because that groundwater flows. So we need to be very careful about water. I wrote an article, we are made of water. 90% of this thing talking to you right now is water. And without that water, I am dust. And all of us are. And the Indians out west, uh, the Standing Rock Reservation, water is life. And without water, none of us are here. So please, fund it, fund the research of it, fund what needs to be done with this. Second issue, please make sure the money is there. I understand this tax business. There's a lot of people who don't like taxes. The problem with that is not spending it appropriately. You've got the money, we expect to pay taxes, spend it appropriately. Uh, reducing taxes when we have a debt is not a smart thing to do. If we have, you know, have a home loan and we choose not to pay it and run that bill up, we create problems. So please, don't reduce taxes. There was somebody that said we should improve gas taxes. Yeah, gas on, you know, all of us feel it like right now. Our roads are in poor shape. We need stuff done. Uh, Highway 80 from here to Hillsboro is one hell of a mess. And they, uh, last week they were out there putting asphalt into some of the holes. The following day we had that rain <clears throat> and that stuff is all over the road. It didn't stay. People evidently, the engineers don't know that when you put stuff on top of water, the water will keep it back up. I mean, when are these people going to learn from having a degree doesn't mean you're smart. Uh, uh, the people here are for a, a reasonable budget, uh, the roads, the gas taxes, uh, equality between, something that was not brought up, public schools. Public school funding has been reduced, reduced, <coughs> reduced, reduced, and finally for the election year it was brought back up for fun. We have public schools that get less funding than private schools. The private schools do not have the same regulations that public schools do. I'm a retired teacher. And this is just not fair. If I'm expected in my classroom to do the certain things, uh, the person that has not a degree in the private sector who cannot teach the same way we can in the public sector is getting more money, this is not appropriate. Uh, and I guess I heard my little ding ling over there. Uh, and with party lines, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, there are right things to do. And I don't give a shit what your label is, excuse me. Uh, you know, we are here to solve problems. We are not here to bash one another. We're here to find common ground in a marriage. If a husband and wife don't get along, you got problems. If you get along, you can solve anything. By the way, uh, a family is a socialist thing. <laughs> Everything is shared by everybody, right? So socialism is not a bad word. Oh, oh. oh. All right, we gotta get to the next person. So anyways, thank you. All right, thank next you. up is Seal oh. Simonson. I'll pray for you, thank you. Oh. Thanks for your service. Thank you for all of you for having this uh, listening session. This is one of the first times I've been to any um, political um, event here. But I did attend, because I am concerned about the water in Richland County, specifically, and um, I just wanted to leave that. That was that forum that um, uh, this person, this man was talking about on Saturday, and uh, <coughs> so it was quite well attended. Um, what I learned from that forum was um, that a small child died in uh, Juneau County from a neurotube type of disorder which is related to nitrates in the water. And I know that you have um, 
proposed or do have some money in a program called SWIG, uh, which includes some research to be done in Lafayette Grant in Iowa. I would love for you <coughs> to um, put in your notes that Richland County would love to be included in that or should be included because of the car system, the U-shaped type of amount of uh, soil and um, uh, geology that's in this area. I would hate to have a small child in Richland County develop something like this neurotube disorder before we decide that that's important to be part of this research. And I also would like to know if, well not know, but um, uh, there's 3,000 plus wells in this county and um, some are abandoned, which um, are not capped. They're not always capped. That's expensive. And of the 3,000 wells, private wells, etc., cetera, uh, the, these farmers and these landowners need assistance in testing their water so that they can do something if they have small children or are raising a family on a farm. They need to know um, that. And I want to say that um, I've done lots of traveling in my um, short life here on earth or long life whatever and um, I've seen countries that don't pay taxes and I see what they get and I want to say that I am proud of paying taxes and I don't mind paying taxes when I know the money is being prioritized and, and um, put in the areas for health education environment. That's all. Thank you. Next up is John Collins. Hi. My name is John Collins. I'm a city alderman here in Richmond Center. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you guys coming here today and uh, getting yelled at and mm -hmm. called names. So I'll, I'll refrain from doing that. Uh, my concern from a city standpoint is the dark store loophole. And a little community like Richmond Center, uh, it really affects. So if these stores and businesses, I applaud them for employing people here in our community, but at the same time, if they're gonna go and force us to spend money uh, through uh, litigation to stop them from uh, lowering their uh, uh, estimated worth from 15 million to seven million, that burden then goes on to the taxpayer, mm -hmm. which is the homeowner. Yes. And there's fewer and fewer homeowners because we haven't been building houses. <coughs> There's apartments that are going to so those people aren't paying uh, the property tax to help support the roads and <coughs> in our city. So I, I would really ask you from a city standpoint to push hard to close that loophole and not allow these large, these large buildings to say that they should be taxed as empty buildings, even though they're doing uh, millions of dollars worth of business every year in our community. And again, I'm not against business, but this part of it uh, really concerns me, putting the load back on the uh, taxpayer. The other thing is, north of our city, uh, we are doing a project of rip wrapping banking. And uh, that money came from a CBDG grant that was part of a uh, construction loan for our uh, wastewater treatment plant. And for the first time in their history, they allowed us to keep the money because we did a good job in uh, construction and we're $1.2 million under budget. But at the same time, the state keeps lowering the phosphorus numbers coming out of that discharge pipe at our uh, wastewater treatment plant. So this was a way to um, rip wrap and stop erosion, stop the phosphorus and other chemicals in the soil every time we have a flood, which is now about every eight months. Um, and so the goal was to make it a uh, pilot program so that we could sell credits to Blue River and Sextonville and these others that don't have the funds to cover those um, uh, cover those discharges. They can't put up a new wastewater treatment plant. So I just want to make sure that you're aware of this pilot program uh, that we are we started here at Richmond Center first in the in the state, and that that program uh, goes forward that it doesn't get stopped by somebody new coming in and saying, well, we're not going to give you that credit. You know, that's $475,000 of taxpayers' money that are going to uh, make those stream banks better. And for the fishery part, uh, we're putting in root wads along the way, and it's going to probably be one of the top uh, rivers in our region when we're done as far as the fishery. So thank you for your uh, time here, and 
um, uh, and your willingness to be yelled at for the next three or four years. <laughs> <laughs> next up is Carol Stevenson. Unless you, there you go. All right. <laughs> she wasn't I didn't know sure. I was going to speak today, but after <laughs> listening to all these people that came, uh, I do have uh, some questions about the water. And uh, myself, last, last year, uh, last fall, our well went out after so much flooding, and uh, and I did come down with E. coli, and we have a new well put in, and it it needs some addressing. On the other hand, I get pretty tired of Richland County doing this, being blind to things that are going on right in our backyard about our quality of water. And I imagine all of you know about pollution. Well, why are some people not accountable for all the oil and old gas and old stuff going into our streams right out of town? And we know who that person is. Uh, no, don't tap me on the leg. <laughs> uh, there's a particular salvage company that pollutes every day. And we wouldn't take an old car that has fuel and oil in it and set it near our stream and let it pollute. And yet, this person does. And it's been reported many, many times. And that has to be addressed. Because all it does is make you think, well, who's getting paid off? Because nothing ever happens. And I've got friends that live nearby there, and the stream is bad. So that's my comment. I think the water is important, like all these people said. But Let's address what's in our own county and take care of it. Next up is Barbara Blackmore. I'll try to keep it short. Um, as a result of some petitions I signed, I guess I got on uh, um, <coughs> Senator Mark Lang's email list, and I was happy to see that you're introducing some bills to help rural school districts get some extra money. I would like to add that I agree with the statement over here about the voucher schools. Um, our constitution requires separation of church and state, and we are giving money to parochial schools as well as other private schools. And I don't, don't know how that's legal. and. As he indicated, we're giving more money per student to voucher schools than we are to public schools. That doesn't seem right to me. The other thing I would like to bring up is returning money to state parks. We've had that taken away from our state parks. That's a big draw for tourists, and I thought that was important to this state, but that has been removed and the money needed to get into the parks is increasing and I think it's important for young kids to get into the parks and help maintain them for the future. Next up is Larry Engel. Good morning. Um, I have two issues that I'd like to talk with you about some on behalf of the Career Education Cooperative. We're five school districts, and we have 30 businesses, and we provide apprentices. Um, we recently did a survey of all the schools, and we worked with the stu students, and there's currently no education track that's for apprentices. And we have students from early childhood up to K through 12, and maybe even eventually university professors that would like to teach. Um, so we'd ask you to help us um, get that e education track in place. The second thing is the um, <coughs> apprenticeship site of a light lifeguard. We, there's a, we have an aquatic center that's going in. We have all kinds of places, but currently 
um, it's not approved as a site for premises. And we think in the hospitality industry and in the public safety and in the um, medical field, it's a perfect apprenticeship site. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next is, okay, Dan Gaidoshek. Did I say it? Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for not increasing taxes in Wisconsin since we are the sixth highest tax state in the nation. Thank you for your support in rural education. And I'd like to bring to your attention the fact that we need the canine funding for our canine in Richland Center. We currently have one, which is with the Sheriff's Department, but we need a, another canine unit along with uh, assistance on replacing our police uh, cars, Sheriff's Department and Police Departments. Uh, we need to identify repeat offenders, those that are involved with uh, distribution of methamphetamine, marijuana, heroin, and other uh, substances. Uh, increase the fine for parents who host Currently, is just a slap on the wrist. Uh, the areas that I would like to see increased attention on is not to pass a law that allows marijuana in our region, and for the treatment, uh, we need increased help there as far as uh, those that are uh, using substances especially with the e-cigarettes that are becoming more popular in this whole area that needs some better studies. And also, when it comes to rural education, I'm happy to see that um, steps are being taken to educate all of our public. And I would like to bring to your attention the American Workforce Advisory Board that the uh, governor of Iowa has spoken about. And as far as the uh, <clears throat> other areas that I would like to talk about is on compliance checks for alcohol. Our uh, police department and sheriff's department, since we're a, a county seat, it's difficult to uh, get compliance checks that tell where last place of the drink was ordered and things that go on in our county and region uh, seem to support the alcohol use and that has to stop. The gateway drugs like the marijuana and alcohol uh, for those uh, young people who haven't had their frontal lobes fully developed, it seems to be a big problem. We need help in those areas. Thank you. Next is Jardo Bezdecki. Uh, <coughs> I will defer most of what I would like to speak of has been mentioned there's a few things that <clears throat> I would like you to consider before I defer is BDS you've destroyed our first amendment right with that law that you guys passed thank you Steve Downs Steve Downs at the University of the Center um, I'd like to address a couple of issues um, I hear a lot of people talking about um, about water quality, and I share your concerns. Um, <clears throat> I just must uh, tell you that we do already have really good drinking water. I lived in, for a year in Marshalling, Missouri, which had a really awful water treatment plant, and their source of water was not wells like around here. It was uh, a lake, which uh, turns over every spring and fall <coughs> and because the water treatment plant was so bad when the when the lake would turn over the, the tap water would turn yellow you'd flush the toilet and look like somebody already peed in it was awful but so we have great water around here let's keep it that way okay um, a couple of the things that I want to touch on um, illegal immigration uh, there is a there is uh, a way to uh, dissuade some of the 
magnets that draw people here, <coughs> and that is to uh, rewrite the tax code such that companies cannot uh, deduct wages uh, that they pay workers unless they've used E-Verify to check that those workers are in fact legal workers. And I would like that to be uh, added into the, the, the uh, laws. And um, one more thing, uh, I don't like uh, daylight savings time. <laughs> but, you know, we just go back and forth and back and forth and stay one side or the other. Either we on standard time or on daylight time. We don't need to be switching back and forth. And the federal government has no power to force us to. If you read the Constitution, the powers of the, of the uh, federal government, which were granted to the federal government by the states that created it, are listed in Article 1, Section 8, and they're very specific, and most of what the federal government does is not listed there. The powers uh, forbidden to the states by that document are in Article 1, Section 10. The Tenth Amendment states that those powers not granted to the federal government by this document, nor forbidden to the states by it, are reserved to the states, or to the people respectively. So we have the power where, the, where it's not listed in the, federal, in the federal constitution. The state is supreme, or we are. And so daylight savings time is not listed. Neither is healthcare for that matter. So step up, tell the federal government to go fly kite. Thank you. And next up is Warren Keys. Uh, this is a hard route to follow because we've been all over the place. I don't like changing daylight saving time, but I kind of like daylight saving time. So we can stay there. Um, anyway, we have a new governor, and since he announced his budget, which is totally off the wall, uh, the only thing I can think when he ran, he, I don't think he sounded like the minute he got to the budget, he went to the left. I, I say it's like he got onto a six lane highway, went to the far left lane, going the wrong damn direction. And I'm just sick and tired of this governor in just, what, three weeks or four weeks. Um, he had a pre conference with the media prior to the budget. He locked up conservative media. Now when Trump tried to kick out CNN or whatever, he caught hell. And Governor Evers, I haven't heard boo from anybody, but somebody I listened to on radio talked about, he locked out the media there. It'd be like you guys as Republicans locking out their Richland Democrat observer. You know, don't come. And I don't know. This, this uh, he's against free enterprise. He's paying back his schools. Uh, I say he's a puppet for Soglin, Mayor Soglin. His budget looks exactly what Mayor Soglin would, would do. And Mayor Soglin is from the People's Republic of Madison. And the people's budget is from the People's Republic of Madison. And if you in, let him increase the wages 2% of all the farmers out here, we're starving. We're, we're hurting. He should not be increasing government wages by 2%, and he shouldn't be doubling the budget in two years. I don't know if it's just for the schools or in general, doubling the budget for the state in two years. Now, I know Governor Walker increased the budget almost $700 million for schools last year, and now he's just dumping on top of that. That's just unconscionable. Um, marijuana. My younger brother, who was three years younger than me, died last fall. He was on marijuana in, in college. And marijuana is a gateway drug. To, this guy over here knows what he's talking about. Our governor wants marijuana to ruin the young generation of, of our state. And he should be railroaded out of town right now just on that one issue. I think it's 
marijuana destroyed my brother's life, but he never amounted to anything because he got into drugs and alcohol. And you know what happens when you start with marijuana? You kind of step up a little bit. And uh, if you're going to spend money, I know the governor thinks you've got a lot of money to spend. If you're going to spend money, spend it on the roads. Take as much money as you want, put it in the roads. Give him nothing for his wild boondoggle, People's Republic of Madison budget. Um, the farm economy is in terrible shape. Uh, I don't know if you can do any assistance, but don't hurt us. Um, Warren, can you wrap up your thoughts there real quick? Okay, just a minute. Thank you. Um, So the governor increased his wages for his appointees by 10%. That's unconscionable. If whatever amount of money he took, and I think it's 200000 or something, take that money out of someplace else. If he's going to take it, take it, take it away from someplace else. That's unconscionable to increase his salaries for his people. He's got one nominee who is a felon, charged with a felony, that's going in charge of safety. She, uh, she poked her kid. Now that's, how can you put somebody in charge of safety who is charged with a felony? I, I, have, no, I have no comprehension of this new governor. I call him the puppet governor. Next up is Becky Jones. Thank you. Thank you for coming to our community. I'm Becky Dell, the Regional Director for the Aging and Disability Resource Center for the area of Crawford, Dudo, Richland, and Sauk. And um, we, as you know, and thank you for your ongoing support to our, to our agency, is that we provide services, free and confidential information assistance and benefit counseling for our elders, all elders, people with disabilities um, in our communities. Um, we just learned last week from our state, from our state department that, um, as you know, we're state and federally funded. And we just learned last week that there's a, a federal grant called Nursing Home Relocation that is ending this year. What that program is um, designed to do and what, what we require to do is that um, if somebody's in a nursing home and they tell their social work, nursing home social worker, um, or their families will say that we're interested in learning about community um, options, whether it be moving to a less restrictive setting or returning home is that their social worker will contact us and say this this family would like to learn about options or if somebody is going into a nursing home and the social worker will ask would you like to learn about what kind of community options that there are and they say yes is that then we'll go see so it really is a way for us to work collaboratively with nursing homes but a way for people to learn about what um, options are available in the community as we all know that that's that's really a very cost-effective um, so with this federal funding ending, is that, that will we're still required to do this work, um, but that will really significant change kind of um, what we're really able to do in our communities. Um, and our, of course our preferred strategy would be is to advocate for this federal money, because of course we always try very hard to, to, to use all federal money, um, but as you know, we're also state funded. So my ask is that, um, is that we take a look at that and then we can um, talk more about um, how that will really impact our ADFCs in this area but also across the state. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Kenneth Smith. Here. I have a couple of things but my uh, my main thing that I uh, have a pet peeve with is the roads. Um, there's been a lot of construction on 56 and 80 junction there by Warren and uh, I was uh, I wrote a letter to you guys about that because I thought right away, what the heck are you doing? You know, changing the thing again, putting the new bridge in somewhere. But I found out the truth that that the old bridge was not one that could be redone, so they had to start from scratch. But it's like um, it's like the guys that we elect have lost control of what's going on in these uh, uh, different parts of the government. And uh, in particular, the DOT, the um, uh, guys that make the rules, uh, it's like they um, have these rules that don't make a lot of sense sometimes, or at least common sense isn't applied. For example, going out of town towards 
Europa on, eight, on um, 14, they've got islands all over the place. You know, it's like uh, you have to be more uh, 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 observant and it could have been a lot simpler. What I'm suggesting is that if you use some common sense and don't apply a lot of the things that might make sense for some of the big cities, the smaller areas, you might uh, be able to save some money and apply it somewhere else in the roads. I wrote a letter to you guys about the um, double yellow line. I said, what's the point of a double yellow line? A, a solid yellow line, you're not supposed to pass. You're not supposed to, uh, it, you know, it just restricts you. What's the point of having a double yellow line? When you have a broken line on the road, that means you can pass. If you got a single broken line, that means either side can pass in that zone. So why do you have to have a double yellow line? I don't know what kind of money you'd save on paint, but maybe the truck would be smaller, it would do the painting, and uh, maybe it could be applied somewhere else. Anyway, um, that's pretty much it. Oh, and then of course my big concern is that stupid intersection of uh, 14 and 80. I don't know who designed that. It had to have been some genius in Madison again. <laughs> I mean, that's a simple green, go one direction, red, stop. Uh, you know, uh, these guys that are doing this stuff, it, it, it's like they're trying to apply big city stuff to a small community. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Oh, yeah. No, I don't want to talk about red. <laughs> But anyway, uh, my other thing that I uh, notice is there's a big push for broadband. And I wrote a letter to you guys about the broadband. I said, no, no, wait a minute. Wouldn't it make more sense if you had cell phone access? Because if you got cell phone access, you got access to the internet. I mean, if you're stuck out on the road somewhere and uh, you don't have any way to, you know, um, uh, um, call for help. If you got your cell phone and you got service, you can do that. But the internet, that ain't going to do you much good. Anyway, that's pretty much it. Next is Raymond Schmidt. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming here today. Um, I want to talk a little about uh, groundwater. We're all concerned about it. The farming community is concerned about it. I'm a retired semi-retired farmer, 700 cow dairy, which is large for Richland County, but very small on the national scene. We have always been um, conscious of well water. Our uh, Department of Ag comes out periodically, tests our wells. Those samples are sent in. Um, this happens uh, probably annually to have this water check. And I think the concerns about wells is there are a lot of old wells in Richland <laughs> County that are not up to standards. They could be point-driven wells that just go down 10, 12 feet to water. There are wells that are put in that are just galvanized casings. They go down a short uh, amount of feet. They don't go to bedrock. Um, I, it's important, but uh, overreaction on this can cost uh, a lot of money to a lot of people. Um, homeowners, when, they, when property is transferred, water is tested. I, I would want the well tested if I bought a home. Um, so uh, I think we have to approach this in a realistic manner and not alarm a lot of people. Um, e. coli, sure, E. coli is everywhere. It gets into our water, our food supply. The, the, it's everywhere, on the floors. So, and a gentleman spoke about uh, trout streams and we have uh, maybe several miles of creeks, beds in our farms. We are very conscious about uh, rip-wrapping and protecting the areas 
and Ash Creek is a very popular spot. We have yet denied anyone to fish that would ask permission. But at this time, I don't think we're willing to give up the right to give permission or not permission, you know, to uh, give up that easement to it. Um, we're not there yet. Uh, it, it could happen, but uh, not at this time. And the, the, I think there's a difference also between groundwater and surface water that we talk about. There's a lot of pollution with surface water uh, washing into our streams. Uh, our farms are controlled by the DNR as far as manure application. We, we uh, hose it, use a hose, knife it in, very little surface supply. Not hardly any in the winter time. If we have to spread some uh, uh, like box stall stuff, it's put on a flat surface so we don't get runoff. Our streams in the springtime are running cleaner like the waterways. We don't have the discolored water. So we are making progress in the farming community. So um, uh, farming has, it was mentioned as rough at this time, that is true. The margins are not there. Um, look at the sale bills in the papers. A lot of dairies are going out. Um, this is not a good thing for our community. I think you gentlemen realize that, that a farm or two support a lot of different businesses. So what can be done? The farmers are doing an excellent job of producing. The problem is distribution. We can't get rid of our products. Um, there's too many barriers in different regions to allow our products to be sold, even within the United States, not just globally. So uh, I would ask that someone focus a little more on the state side of it, on distribution, or the people in charge. Thank you. So we are at 11.30, but we have two more speakers left, if you can hang in there. Um, just want to give everyone an idea of where we are, and then the legislators will give their little wrap up and we'll move on. So um, Ida Ryan is next. I guess um, I've heard many points all across the room today, but one thing I haven't heard mentioned a whole lot is I'm very concerned about the uh, farms. So many farms going out of business not only locally, but you know, all around us. And I think when, you, when you, it's like with the water, if you don't have good water, you're dead. Well, if you don't have enough food supply, to the farmers have to supply the whole world, you're in deep crap. <laughs> and I would just like to thank all of you for coming here today. And I did catch the morning show too with um, a lot of good points made by all three of you there. So thank you. Um, and finally, Bob Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bob Frank, and I'm here today as just a <coughs> citizen, uh, even though I do work directly with the State 911 Subcommittee, a governor appointed committee. And I want to thank both Howard and uh, Tony, because any communication I've had with you have always been good, it's been professional. Anytime I've stopped in your office, your staff has always been right there. Whether we agree or not, um, it's, always been, it's always been very good. So one of the things, I hope people have taken a chance to look at the governor's budget. One of the things that I'm very concerned about on under military affairs, currently the 911 and emergency communications falls under military affairs. Where we think it should be, because it's handled well, it's, it was switched over there a couple of years ago, and we've gotten more done in the last 18 months for the 911 system in Wisconsin than we have in the last five years. The budget is asking that to transfer from DMA, the Office of Emergency Communications, to DOT. Okay, we currently have a $2.9 million federal grant we're working on. And as you know, in government, when you switch from agency to agency, it takes time, it takes different people, it changes phone numbers, and we could possibly lose that. That's just one of the items. We'd have a different procurement officer. We'd have different people working with it. And we don't know if our staff would change either. So we're currently working on, we currently have a $7 million budget that comes out of what you are currently paying on your cell phone. 
So if you look at your cell phone bill, it says 75 cents police and fire protection. Okay? There's about $50 million roughly that comes in for that. We are currently getting $7 million of that. The rest of it is going other places. And that's not right either. That's money you're paying to go to improve 911 services, emergency communications, radio and stuff for Wisconsin that we're not getting to do that job. So my first concern is for the budget perspective, when you see that item, and I got a copy of it here under military affairs, it is transferring that authority that we have in the 911 emergency communications to the Department of Transportation. We're doing a good job, we're doing well, and why take the money and the change and the resources? Why waste those money and resources to move it to a different agency? Okay. Um, I'll show you my here, here. We have an RFP going out, a request for proposal for what's called an ESINET. The ESINET is Emergency Services Network, and that will tie all the 911 centers together for backup, for resources, and for cost savings. That's supposed to go out later this year. If you do a transfer to another agency, we don't know what's going to happen. Why are we taking that money and resources and we're doing a good job? I'm, we're not even sure why it's being transferred there. We haven't been, been told any of that yet. Um, yeah, your, your question about uh, internet calls not going out and, and the broadband. Broadband is part of this. And calls do go out over the internet regularly. The problem we have is we can't answer them on a 911 system because our system is so old. The best example I can give you is how many of you know of Uber? the car service company, um, Uber can find you faster than 911 can in Wisconsin. We're that old, okay? And is that a bad thing? No, because we're changing, we're making those improvements. So really I'd ask you guys, any questions, please let me know. But transferring that is just a waste of time. It's a waste of resources for something we're already doing well. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, Bob was our final speaker. So, uh, do you have any wrap up comments? So I'll turn it over. So. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for all the, the comments. Um, I think uh, overarching water obviously is a huge, huge issue. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, that's one of the reasons why, uh, as I was knocking doors here in Richland Center this past uh, summer and fall, uh, water was uh, a, a large uh, component of many of your concerns. And so that's why when the Water Quality Task Force came into existence, uh, I actually volunteered to do that. Uh, Representative Trannel and Representative Novak were actually some of the leads on trying to get that speaker task force developed. So uh, I would highly encourage you over the next couple months to please uh, look at our e-updates. Uh, we are leading on this, especially I'm very proud of the southwest corner of the state. Um, and I would hope in the future you may not agree with everything we do or everything we uh, stand for but I think we can rally around the water issue and just please know we are working on that. Um, and like I said, we are actually on the forefront of it. Uh, Representative Novak is actually the chair. So that's a good thing. Uh, but, uh, I'm, uh, but once again, I appreciate our comments. And uh, like I said, I took a lot of notes, and, uh, but I appreciate you coming. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, I guess I'll just echo that uh, again thanks for coming 24 people I took notes wrote down all your names uh, to go off the water uh, first off split government I think is kind of interesting Senator Markline and I we've done this for a while and so far my observation with split government has meant that we have a more diverse crowd so it's kind of interesting to hear you try to outclap each other but it sort of <laughs> it sort of shows you the uh, the difficulty of our job right because you might feel very passionately one way and you look across the room and there's your neighbor who feels very passionately and a hundred percent the opposite so it's not that we're not listening or that we were never listening it's just that there is a broader group of people out there that you may not be aware of that we are very familiar with uh, to groundwater the reason I would like to talk about it a little bit is because I think you hit the nail on the head and when you read the quote that I said our job's going to be difficult as long as the government continues to subsidize farmers to keep them in business, mm -hmm. uh, that was a conversation I was having while I was on my own farm with a reporter while I was fencing. <laughs> and what I was trying to convey by that is we have chosen in this country to have very cheap food. Right. We are very blessed that our food in this country is so cheap. When you go into the grocery store and you walk out, you have more money in your pocket than any other people would in the rest of the world. And we've been able to do that by subsidizing farmers. 
Farmers can't produce that food that cheap. It's expensive to produce that food. We keep them in business through subsidization. The downside of that is a lot of people don't understand that. So they see somebody milking 700 cows and they think, man, that farmer must be making all the money in the world. So the, and they're not. The margins are tight. So sometimes the very people that don't like to see those larger <coughs> farms are the very people that are benefiting from the cheap food. And so the challenge that we have and what we need to do is to make sure that any actions we take when it comes to water, we have to take into consideration that one, we all agree we need safe, healthy, clean drinking water, but we can't expect agriculture in this case to bear the financial cost of that. And that's what I was trying to implement is to say that this is so much broader and so much more complex than what the average person understands. And it's one of the reasons, frankly, why we wanted to make sure that we were involved in it because agriculture is obviously a huge component of our local economy. So I think that there are areas where we'll find common ground with the governor. Transportation is one of them. One of my favorite quotes was uh, some genius from Madison. There aren't a lot of those. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> But I, I, I can tell you that uh, one thing I've noticed within our job, a lot of times uh, we get blamed for things that bureaucrats do. And we're sitting there scratching our head at, you know, who thought of this? Why did you think of that? And we spend a lot of our time interacting with those agencies and trying to, uh, to get them to apply common sense. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not always things that we necessarily vote yes or no on. And that's another thing where I think the public would probably be surprised to learn. So uh, obviously you heard we've got our work cut out for us to do. Uh, we will vote for a responsible budget that takes into consideration all of the things that are important to all of us. Also keeping in mind that we are, whoever said it, uh, the sixth highest tax state in the country currently. So we just need to make sure that it's responsible budgeting. <coughs> Thanks everybody for being here. Uh, appreciate all the all the input uh, we've heard. Um, on water quality, um, just say last Saturday I was up. Uh, my uh, twin grandchildren turned nine yesterday, so I was in the Twin Cities this weekend. So that's where I was. So I obviously wasn't able to attend the, the event on, on Saturday. So um, you know, and I'm so glad that we've got uh, every one of my, uh, all three of my uh, state representatives in my you know Senate district are either chairing or on on the uh, uh, task force which is which is awesome I kind of raised my hand to be on it and then it's like you know we're already pretty well represented so no reason for me for me to be on that so I don't know I'm, I'm not on that um, that task force um, in uh, in Lafayette County a couple of weeks ago uh, Travis and I were at uh, Lafayette County Ag Stewardship Alliance which is a farmer led uh, watershed group and uh, great uh, great meeting and uh, they had the, the two researchers there who did the, the water quality or the, the well testing last November and stuff. So that was a good presentation part of that. And uh, if you're in the if you're in uh, Grant, Lafayette, or Iowa County, those tests that tests are going to be happening again in about three weeks, three or four weeks. So they got the postcards came in the mail um, this last week, and and this round of testing is going to include DNA testing. So they'll tell not only if you have a contaminant, but what's the source of it. Is it human waste? Is it uh, animal waste? If it's animal, you know what, what kind. So the the importance of that is we got to, we got to know what we're dealing with. It doesn't do it, you know, or, or is it a failing well? That the and we we know that we we've got enough failing wells that you know we need to. So I think the there's going to be multiple. Problems and, and which are going to require multiple solutions. Obviously, we got to make sure we get we get the right stuff. But um, you know, it, it, talking about farming, you know, I know it's tough out there right now. And and uh, yet uh, at the, this uh, meeting in Darlington a couple of weeks ago, um, Don Niles, who chairs, he's the president of uh, Peninsula Pride. He's a farmer, dairy farmer from up in Kiwani, and and they've got. You think we got bad water? I mean, there is their water stinks literally when they people you know spread manure and for years you know they accepted it it was just well manure is getting spread today well it's it's a different day up there and, and his um one of his takeaways at least I, one of my takeaways for me when he talked up at that meeting was um we need to wait to get the data till we know exactly what we're dealing with what the problem is but he said farmers if you're the problem assume responsibility embrace it and be part of the solution and I think that it was a very good, and that's what they've done up there, and I think you're seeing more and more.
farmer-led uh, groups, um, you, know, <coughs> you know, Ray was talking about doing the right thing, you know, and uh, so uh, I'm, you know, that, that, that's, uh, that's, that's a good thing. So um, budget process, going to be a long process. We start um, probably in a couple weeks with agency briefings, and then we're going to be doing, um, the, let me see, we, the Joint Finance Committee will be doing public hearings around the state, uh, Milwaukee area, Green Bay, I'm sure we'll be doing, you know, four, at least four, maybe five around the state, so it's a good chance for public input as well uh, for, for people. So, and then probably in May, early May, we start the actual voting on, on the budget. Process is going to be identical to what we did two years ago. We're going to start with base, which is what we did two years ago. Uh, we didn't take Walker's budget, we started with base, we'll be doing the same thing uh, this time around. So, um, hopefully we'll get the yeah, budget done by, uh, by June 30th. So. Anyway, so anyway, uh, thanks for everybody being here. So. Yeah, thank you for being here. And also, would you set up a time to come back for you to have a question and answer session yeah, right. where we could ask, you know, for clarification, you know, so I'd like to invite you back mm -hmm. to do that. I mean, listening sessions are good, but a little little more from you information would be even better. Mm -hmm. So please consider coming back. Thank you. Why aren't we? Do you have no idea? 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 Do you I'll leave that with you. But yeah, that is, that's craziness. So I've mentioned it to the chair, the both vice chairs. Are all but we got it. Thank you.